In the last section of our program, we talked about how there are basically only two maintenance problems with heat exchangers. A blockage was one of these problems, and we looked at the procedures you'll use to clear out blockage in large components. We also talked about cleaning out the heat exchangers before inspecting them for any evidence of leakage. Leakage is the second of the two problems you'll have to deal with when you work on heat exchangers, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this segment. We're going to follow Mel and his crew as they look for some evidence of leakage in the condenser we saw them cleaning. We'll also take a look inside the big feed water heater we've seen. We'll show you how leaks are taken care of in these big components, too. Earlier on, we saw Mel and his helper clean out the condenser water box. They scraped the tube sheets and picked debris out of the ends of the tubes. Then the water box was shoveled clean. Finally, Mel's helper shot the tubes of the condenser to clear them of any crud that had accumulated inside them. Now that the water side of the condenser has been cleaned, they can look for tube leaks, and you can do this in a couple of different ways. One of these methods is a very simple test. This test uses the same plastic wrap that's so popular for use in the kitchen. Of course, there are many brands of this wrap available, but this is the stuff that seems to stick to everything, even itself. A vacuum is drawn on the shell side of the condenser as if it were in operation. Now, this step is unnecessary if the condenser is operating under reduced load with it half opened up. The plastic wrap is laid over wetted tube sheets like wallpaper. Sheets of plastic are overlapped so all the ends of the tubes are covered. You do this at both ends of the tubes so they'll be sealed off completely. If there's a leak in any tube, the plastic wrap will be sucked into the ends of the tube that's leaking. You can even tell how bad the leak is. If it's big, the wrap may be sucked in so hard it'll pop in the opening. Other substances can be used for this test. A soap and water mix or foam can be brushed over the tube sheet. Where the bubbles are sucked in reveals leaking tubes. Wherever a leak is found, the tube is plugged at both ends so the cooling water won't get into the condensate when the system's running. Tubes are plugged like this instead of being repaired because it isn't possible to get into the tube bundle to all the places a tube might be leaking. In a minute, we'll see how leaking tubes are plugged. But before we do, let's look at another way we have to look for tube leaks. This is a test that has to be done when the turbine is shut down. Now, this way is more involved, but it allows you to find leaks you might not be able to detect with the vacuum test. Our second method uses a fluorescent dye to seek a leaking tube, and here's how it's done. After the water side of the condenser has been drained and cleaned, jacks or supports are placed under pads on the condenser. This is because the shell of the condenser is going to be flooded with water. The jacks and supports are necessary to hold all the extra weight on the shell. Remember that many main steam condensers are suspended below the turbine and they just won't hold up under all the water's extra weight. Once the supports have been put into place, the operators flood the condenser with clean water with the fluorescent dye added. As the dye mixes with the water, any leakage from the shell into the tubes or around tube ends will become visible under black light. Black light is the light produced by an ultraviolet lamp. It causes the dye to glow bright green. Wherever there's dye coming out from around a tube end or out of a leaking tube, it'll be easily visible using this method of inspection. So we've seen a couple of common methods of locating leaking condenser tubes. Other methods may be used, but generally any method used will be a variation of the two we've seen. Be sure to learn how it's done in your plant. Once the leaking tubes are found, they get plugged to keep cooling water from contaminating the condensate in the shell. Now tubes can be plugged in one of several ways. Remember that to do the job right, you have to plug the tube at both ends to keep the cooling water out. There are several kinds of plugs for this purpose. What kind of plug to use may be chosen by the components manufacturer, or your plant may have special requirements. Your instructor can fill you in on how to find out in your plant. The most common are made of a fibrous material and are shaped like the stopper of a bottle. They're tapered so you can fit them into the tube ends and then just hammer them in tight. They'll stay in place partly because water pressure will push in on them. Also, the fibrous material of the plug will tend to expand when it's soaked with water to hold the plug in even more tightly. Other kinds of plugs are used to do the job, too. Some of the older plugs used in this condenser have slotted heads. They're threaded plugs that screw into the ends of the tubes. 
They cut their own thread, sort of like a wood or sheet metal screw. The threads grab into the metal of the tube and hold tight. These are metal plugs, and they don't have to expand in place to hold tight. Now, long experience has shown that the heat and vibration that's present when the unit's running doesn't necessarily loosen plugs too easily, so metal tapered plugs can be hammered in tightly enough to hold. A metal tapered plug will sometimes seal a minor leak between the tube and the tube sheet by forcing the end of the tube more tightly into the hole in the tube sheet. To be sure it's sealed, if there's any doubt, a metal plug can then be welded around to make a permanent positive seal. Another type of plug that's sometimes used to seal a leaking tube is an expandable plug. These have a rubber donut sandwiched between two large washers with a bolt running through the middle. When the bolt is tightened, the rubber is forced to expand outward. This seals the tube tightly enough that the plug won't loosen and come out. For extreme service requirements, such as high pressure heaters in nuclear power plants, there are even explosive plugs that are detonated to expand them into place. Now let's take a look at plugging leaks in a high pressure feed water heater. Here we'll see two other methods of plugging tubes and leaks between tube bins and tube sheets. This big heater has been opened because it was known that it had some leakage. When they opened it up, they found that some tubes were leaking. And they also found that some of the tube ends had vibrated loose from the tube sheet and were allowing leakage. Two different kinds of plugs were used in this heater. The older ones are expandable metal plugs. The hard metal pin in the middle is driven in with a hammer and forces the softer metal of the plug to expand in the tube end. The others are tapered metal plugs just installed recently. Notice that some of these have been welded in place. They've done this to seal a leak between the tube end and the tube sheet. Where several adjacent tubes may have come loose at once, the whole bunch of them is welded over to seal any further leakage. If the tubes were much larger in diameter, they might have welded plugs in the ends of them. Now, whether we're talking about a condenser or any other shallow tube heat exchanger, there's only a certain percentage that can be plugged before the heat exchanger begins to lose efficiency. Usually, you can plug between 10 and 20% before it affects the component's efficiency. You can find out what that percentage is on the piece you're working on by checking manufacturer's spec sheets for that component. For this reason, and also to make sure that plugs haven't come out during operation, it's important to record exactly which tubes are plugged. When you know that you're reaching the maximum percentage, you can plan tube replacement well in advance. When that maximum percentage is exceeded, it's time to replace the tubes. When that's done, usually all the tubes are done at once because it's most economical to do it that way. Usually, tube replacement is a job that's contracted out to a refitter or to the component's manufacturer. This may involve having to ship pieces out, or the component may be repaired at your facility. Depends on the size of the component. Tubes are replaced by carefully cutting them away from the tube sheet so the tube sheet isn't damaged. New tubes are installed the same way the old ones were put in. And this could be one of two ways. Rolling tubes is the first way. It's a method of expanding the ends of the tubes into corrugated holes in the tube sheets. The corrugations hold the tube in place and provide a strong seal against leakage. The second way tubes may be fixed to tube sheets is by welding. And this is usually done for components operating under high temperature and high pressure conditions. Welding is done carefully and provides a very strong bond between tubes and tube sheets of compatible metals. In either case, it'll probably be your job to prepare the heat exchanger for the retubing job. And this will mean you'll have to rig the component to open it and close up the component after the tube bundle is back in place. This will involve the careful rigging of the parts of the heat exchanger. Gaskets to seal large header plates and gaskets to seal large baffle flanges may have to be cut from big sheets of gasket material. The sealing surfaces will have to be cleaned smooth of all old gasket material which may be stuck to it. With everything placed carefully, it's a mighty job to handle the impact wrenches. These huge wrenches have to be rigged themselves. They're so heavy. It takes two people to do this task to get these nuts tightened on the studs. After everything's back together, a pressure drop test will be used to make sure the unit is really tight. Now, this is a test where one side of the heater is pressurized and the other is left open. When the pressure source is closed off, any drop in pressure shows evidence of a leak. 
All these procedures we've seen in this segment, inspection to find leaks and the ways you have to seal leaks, are part of the procedures you'll probably follow from time to time when you're called on to do maintenance on large heat exchangers.